It's like a brand new class, and you really wanted TAs who like were in that area. So then you were doing that. It's like the hard way. What area is it? It's like a microprocessor architect that I might have learned back then. And like he wants us to like work during the beginning of the labs. All of your system stuff is like, well, you don't really need Nice. It's all right. It, it does kind of come. Okay. Up. All right. <clears throat> get my voice. Okay. Why don't we get started? So, just want to mention that uh, this afternoon there's a talk by Dr. Ibrahim Alshuk um, from UCLA. He's going to be talking on a systems approach for a biological application. So, this is using systems and controls and optimization methods um, applied. For a biological application. So Jason Martin is hosting the speaker, and he wanted me to announce it. So if you can make it, that'd be great. And I'm hosting a speaker next week, um, Steve Drouillet, who is the president of Sustainable Power Systems. And this will be a joint ECEE RACI seminar. RACI is the Renewable and Sustainable Energy Institute. And Steve will be talking about um, using renewable hybrid power systems for off-grid um, communities. Um, so in particular, if you have off-grid communities, remote villages primarily, they often use diesel, which uh, um, is getting more and more expensive. So can you use a hybrid power system that takes into account wind and solar that might be available along with the, the baseline diesel that's used? OK, so that's next week, Tuesday, um, at 3.30 PM. So this both today's seminar and this one, the, both the ones that I mentioned, are part of the ECE seminar series, so 3.30 on Tuesday. All right. OK, so okay, so just some things that I've posted. Um, so there's a general information sheet on partial fraction expansions, particular for complex conjugate poles. And we'll be talking about partial fraction expansion today. Um, other things that I've posted. Um, so I did post the you know, post lecture to lecture two. I also posted, oh, I posted the link. The link to the streamed videos of these lectures. And I also posted a link to Eric Cheever's page at Swarthmore. <clears throat> so he teaches a linear systems class um, and has a pretty good uh, web page if you want to review Laplace transforms, uh, Z transforms, et cetera. Okay? All right. Any questions? So last week, we overviewed the course. We talked about A to D converters and D to A converters, in particular for D to A converters, the way they're typically implemented with a zero to hold. They impart a delay of approximately half a sample period um, to the loop. Um, in general, when you have a delay in the loop, it makes the system harder to control. And we'll talk more about that throughout the semester. And that's one of the biggest challenges for designing discrete time controllers. Um, we also talked about linear difference equations, how to solve them. Um, you can solve them directly if you have a simple enough difference equation, a first order or second order difference equation. But in general, when you have higher order difference equations, the easiest way to solve them is to use the Z-transform. So you want to go from your difference equation, take the Z-transform, get a transform equation, do algebraic ma manipulations to isolate out and solve for the transform of the variable of interest, and then compute an inverse Z-transform to get the desired time sequence. So we talked about the Z-transform a bit, um, which hopefully is reviewed. So in general, if you have a time domain sequence, E sub K, its Z-transform, so its two-sided Z-transform, is defined with this sum, the Z-transform sum. And the sum uh, makes sense or converges in a region of convergence that's typically annulus shape or two-sided Z-transform. We talked about a particular example of just an exponential sequence, r to the k, 1 of k, where 1 of k is the unit step function. Um, 
and now we have a one-sided sequence, a causal right-handed sequence. Um, and so the region of convergence is the area in the z-plane outside of a disk of some radius here corresponds to the magnitude of this r. Okay. So when you have a two-sided sequence, it, the, the other part of the region of convergence is you know, inside some, some disk, and the intersection of those two ends up giving you an annulus. Okay? So we worked out the Z transform here. It's just Z over Z minus R. Okay? And we talked about different um, cases of R. So one R is equal to one half. We have a stable sequence, and the corresponding pole zero map um, a V of Z contains a pole inside the unit circle. And let's see. Let's choose. Right, so if we actually drew um, the, the region of convergence, right, it would be the region in the Z plane outside of disk of radius equal to one half. So the region of convergence would be look like that. It happens to include the unit circle. And in fact, you can extrapolate out from what we discussed last time that as long as R is strictly less than 1, we have a stable causal signal, right? What we discussed last time is as long as R is strictly less than 1, the pole is strictly inside the unit circle. As long as the pole is strictly inside the unit circle, that region of convergence outside of the disk of radius R is always going to include the unit circle. So in fact, in general, whenever you have a Z transform, if its region of convergence includes the unit circle, it corresponds with a stable sequence. All right? So when R is equal to 1, we have a marginally stable signal. This region of convergence is everywhere outside of the unit circle. So here, the region of convergence doesn't include the unit circle. The unit circle is the boundary of the region of convergence. It's a marginally stable signal. And then lastly, if R is greater than 1, we looked at R is equal to 2. Poles at, at um, R is equal to 2. And here, if we draw its region, or shade in its region of convergence, it's the region outside of this disk of radius 2. Right, so now that region of convergence does not, definitely does, does not include the unit circle. It's not a stable sequence. All right? Okay. So... Um, so we talked about a number of properties of the Z-transform. We proved some of it. Some of those properties, we talked about the linearity property, convolution property, time shift property, and scaling in the um, radial projection in the Z-plane um, property. And we just sort of mentioned this final value theorem. We'll continue to talk about um, the final, uh, talk about the Z-transform today and also talk about um, the inverse Z-transform. So any questions? All right, so the final value theorem. Okay, so the final value theorem states that f, f of z, the z transform, converges for uh, all um, z outside of the unit <laughs> circle, and all poles of z minus 1 times f of z are inside the unit circle. Then the final value of your time domain sequence, f of k, okay, can be computed from your Z transform. It can, compute it can be computed as the limit as Z goes to 1 of Z minus 1 times F of Z. All right, so let's um, talk about you know, what this means. Okay? So the idea here is that if F of Z satisfies these conditions, then in particular if you have a complex enough F of Z, it's easier then to compute the final value of the time domain sequence just from the Z transform. Okay, because if you have a complicated enough f of z, trying to compute the inverse z transform to get your f of k and then look at the final value of f of k might be a lot of work. Okay? All right, so let's look at the conditions a little more. Um, let's look at this one first. Okay, so if f of z converges everywhere outside the unit circle, okay, what that really means is we have a right-handed sequence. It means that we have a causal sequence and it means that f of k is equal to 0 for k is less than 0. So we can see that by, if we look at, um, you know, the definition of f of z, so f of z in general right, is the sum from k is equal to minus infinity 
to infinity of f of k z to the minus k. So let's write that out, especially around k is equal to zero. So k is equal to zero, we have f of zero, z to the zero, which is one. So going for positive k, we have f of one, z to the minus one, f of two, z to the minus two, etc. You know, going to k is equal to infinity. So going the other direction, we have f of minus one, z to the plus one, plus f of minus two, z squared, etc. Going the other direction, all the way to k is equal to minus infinity. All right. So the fact that f of z converges, or all z outside the unit circle, okay, in particular converges as z goes out to infinity, means that f of minus 1 and f of minus 2, etc., must be equal to 0. Because if this sum makes sense for z going out to infinity, then these terms must actually be 0. Right? So all, these, all the terms corresponding to negative k must actually be 0 in order for this to actually hold. Right? So that means, indeed, we have a right-handed sequence, a causal sequence. Right? Okay. And so what we're interested in is what is that final value? What is f of k as k goes to infinity? All right, so now the other condition here is that all the poles of z minus 1 quantity times f of z are inside the unit circle. Okay, that means that that the only pole not strictly inside the unit circle of f of z is a simple pole at z is equal to 1, right, which is then canceled out when you multiply f of z by z minus 1, right? And that kind of, that makes sense given what we've said so far, right? So f of z, if you did a partial fraction expansion, which we'll talk more about, right? So if you, if f of z is some numerator polynomial over a denominator polynomial, okay, and so let's say the denominator polynomial is of the form z minus p1, z minus p2, etc. Um, and there's some numerator polynomial. If you do a partial fraction expansion, right, you'll have something over z minus p1 plus something over z minus p2, where the poles are p1, p2, etc. And these since the poles are strictly inside the unit circle, are going to converge to decaying time domain sequences, right? So these will, the, the inverse of this is a time domain sequence that goes to zero as k goes to infinity, right? And similarly here, okay? And so, in fact, the only term that would contribute to a final value of f of k is that possibly one pole at z is equal to 1, right? That's the only, only one that will invert to a sequence that will have some steady state final value. Okay, so the final value, if all the poles of f of z are strictly inside the unit circle, the final value is going to be 0. Okay, if there's one pole of f of z at z is equal to 1, then there will be some non-zero final value, okay? All right. Any questions? Okay, so now let's talk about the inverse Z transform. Okay, so given a Z transform F of Z, okay, how do we compute the time domain sequence F of K for which F of Z is the Z transform of that sequence? Okay, so in general, we've defined the two-sided Z transform right, of this form, and it has a region of convergence that's an annulus in the z-plane. In this course, we're mostly going to be concerned with one-sided z-transform. So you have your system that's off at first. It will have some initial conditions. And you turn your system on, they'll, you know, the initial conditions will die out. Um, you know, so, so we'll have some time zero. We'll turn it on, and, and, and we have a one-sided uh, sequence. Okay? So in that case, f of k, there's going to be some time zero, and our signal will only start at time zero 
and, and uh, be defined after that. And so in that case, we have a one-sided Z transform. Okay, we're assuming then f of k is zero for k less than zero. Okay, in that case, then our region of convergence is, you know, some region, you know, outside of a disk of some radius, right? And as, if that disk includes the unit circle, then it's a stable sequence, or corresponds with a stable sequence, okay? All right. So again, yeah, if, you know, as long as you have something of this form, if z, if f of z converges for z outside of some region, you know, by the same argument we used before, then f of k must be zero for negative time. Okay, it's, it's causal. Okay, so... We can find the Z-transform a number of different ways. The way that we're going to use the most is the partial fraction expansion. Um, you can also find the Z-transform, the inverse Z-transform, by using long division. And that's particularly useful if you just want to know a few um, you know, of the initial conditions, a few of the initial time steps of the time domain sequence. So say you have F of Z and you just want to know f of z, little f of 0, little f of 1, little f of 2. So you just want to know that. You don't want to know the entire sequence f of k. Um, then long division may be useful. Okay? In particular, if f of z is really complex, um, it's much faster to do long division just to figure out a few of those initial <coughs> values of f of k than to do the whole inversely transform and then solve. Okay, so let's just take an example. Let's look at the, the particular example for which we know what the Z inverse Z transform is. So E of Z is Z over Z minus R. Okay, that's, we computed the Z transform from that E of K sequence, right? And so the way we do long division for finding the inverse Z transform of a right-handed signal, a causal signal, is to write F of Z, in this case E of Z, as a ratio of polynomials in Z inverse. Okay, so we divide by Z in the numerator, divide by Z in the denominator, so we have 1 over 1 minus R Z inverse. So now the numerator and denominator polynomial are in terms of Z inverse, okay, and that's what we need to do first. And then we do long division. So if we go 1 divided by 1 minus R Z inverse, then we have 1 multiply across 1 minus RZ inverse, subtract, we get RZ inverse, and we have plus RZ inverse, multiply across we have RZ inverse, minus R squared Z to the minus 2, subtract, we get R squared Z to the minus 2, and R squared Z to the minus 2, Etc. Right. So, what we want, remember, so e of z by definition, right over here, right, is <clears throat> so in general. It's a two-sided. So e of k z to the minus k. And k is equal to minus infinity to infinity. Okay. So again, here what we see is there are only powers of z where um, the power is negative, so that's equivalent then to a right-handed sequence, right? So all we see are terms of the form e of 0, z to the 0, plus e of 1, z to the minus 1, plus e of 2, z to the minus 2, etc. right? So then if you just compare term by term, e of 0 is the constant term that must be equal to 1. e of 1 is the coefficient of z to the minus 1. That must be r. e of 2 is the coefficient of z to the minus 2. That must be r squared. If you continue, you'll see that in general, right, e of k must be r to the k for k greater than or equal to 0. And that's exactly the sequence that we started with last time when we computed the 4 Z transform, right? It's just R to the K, 1 of K, where 1 of K is the unit step function, okay? All right, so this long division is very useful if you just want to know, you know, the first few terms of the sequence. Say, 
E of 0, E of 1, E of 2, right? Um, if you want to know the entire sequence, it's typically better just to do the partial fraction expansion and find the full form, okay? In particular, because in general, you're not necessarily going to see a pattern emerge. This is a first-order example, so it's, it's easy to see that pattern emerge. Okay, so you can also do long division, just as an aside, a different way. So if I told you that E of Z is of this form, but that it corresponds to an a-causal sequence, a left-handed sequence, okay? You can still do long division. You would do it differently. So I'll do this on the board. Um, right, so there, you would actually leave it, as positive leave, leave it as polynomials of positive powers of z, right? Um, so... And then you would take long division that way. So you have z... You're going to write it as minus r plus z. So it's always the constant term plus the z term. And if it was higher order, you'd go you know, from the lowest order to the highest order in z. Okay? So here you would have um, minus r times z inverse. Oh, minus 1 over r, thank you, times z inverse. So that times minus r. Oh, times z, thank you. So minus 1 of r times z. That would give you z um, minus 1 over r z squared. Subtract would give you 1 over r z squared. Okay, now see if I can get this right. So we need a minus 1 over r squared. That times z squared. Okay, so multiply. You're going to get 1 over r z squared minus 1 over r squared z cubed, subtracting 1 over r squared, z cubed. Let's do one more, so then you have minus 1 over r cubed times z cubed, okay, etc. All right, so now if you compare, right, so e of z, again, okay, in general it's defined by that two-sided sum. What you see here is that you only have positive powers of z, so in fact, you only have an e to the e of minus 1, z, plus e of minus 2, z squared, plus e of minus 3, z cubed, et cetera. I.e., that, that, that um, z transform sum, the only terms that contribute to it are for k is equal to minus 1, minus 2, all the way down to minus infinity. Okay, so we have a left-handed sequence, a causal sequence, right? So if you compare, see that e of minus one is equal to minus one over r, right? And then compare the coefficient of z squared, e of minus two is equal to minus one over r squared, e over e of minus three is minus one over r cubed. And in general, you see that you have e of K, okay, where K is equal to, or less than or equal to minus 1, is equal to minus R to the K, right? So, and in fact, right, in order for, you know, so in order for the sum, to actually converge, right, r has to be magnitude greater than 1. Right, so magnitude must be greater than 1. Right, so if you went through and actually computed the forward transform, you would see that the sum would actually only converge as long as the magnitude of z is less than the magnitude of r. And if you think about it, right, we know that it, the time domain sequence is stable as if you plot this out as a function of k, right, so if you're k greater than or equal to 0, and so this is our time domain sequence e sub k, it's 0. k is equal to minus 1. We have minus 1 over r. Let's look at r is equal to 2, say. So then we have minus 1 half. Then it'll be minus 1 quarter, minus 1 eighth. Etc. So it's, it's stable. 
as long as r is greater than 1, or has a magnitude greater than 1, right? And so then in the z-plane, as I indicated, so here the region of convergence is, so I was looking at r is equal to 2 here. So this was minus 1 half. So your region of convergence is everywhere inside this disk of radius 2, which includes the unit circle, so it is a stable sequence, okay? All right. So any Z transform can be inverted two ways, as a causal sequence, which is mostly what we're going to do this semester, but it can also be inverted as an acausal sequence, okay? And so this actually, I can digress a little bit more. So this is actually something that we've done in my research group in terms of track following. Um, so a lot of times if you have your plant and your compensator, and let's assume, since we're talking digital control here, that it's all discrete time, all right? So you're, you've designed your compensator to hopefully have a good overall closed loop transfer function. And I hope, hopefully, you can write down the overall transfer function from your reference input to your output, right, is dg over 1 plus dg. Okay, and hopefully it has some nice properties, converges well, etc. So this can be written as a ratio of numerator polynomial to denominator polynomial overall, right? So in general, you'd like for your Y to follow your R. So your robotic application, welding or something, you want that robot to follow a particular trajectory very well. Right, so if your R as a function of time, okay, I'm going to draw it as a continuous time, but you want your output Y to track this very well, okay, because you want to weld, you want to be precise, precise or whatever. You want to follow a particular trajectory very well. So you, this is your R of K. You'd like Y of K to follow that very well. So some of the stuff that we've done in my research group is to look at can a feed-forward controller help you, right? So instead of relying only on that feedback controller to get that good tracking performance, if we take our R and feed it into a feed-forward controller, I'll call that F, Okay, we typically call it F closed loop, changes the input into the closed loop. Okay, in particular, if FCL is equal to HCL inverse, right, then Y theoretically will be exactly equal to R, right, because R would come in, go through an HCL inverse, and go through HCL, you know, the closed loop system, so theoretically, Y would track R perfectly, right? So the question is, can you implement HCL inverse? So a lot of times it turns out the systems we deal with are such that they're non-minimum phase zeros. They're zeros of B of Z that are outside the unit circle. So presumably, if you've done your feedback control design right, you have a stable system. So A of Z has all its roots inside the unit circle. But your plant might have unstable zeros and you can't do anything about them with feedback control. So now you'd like HCL inverse. You'd like to implement HCL inverse, which theoretically is A over Z over B over Z. But if B of Z had unstable roots, that's going to show up as poles now of your HCL inverse filter. And typically, you don't want to implement an unstable filter. But if you, you can actually implement it in a causal fashion, right? And so typically, say, in a manufacturing line, a robot application, you know that reference trajectory long in advance. So you know what it's going to be. So it's OK to implement an a causal filter because you know what R of K is going to be in, in the future, right? And so if you really do have kind of a, so really, technically, this has an infinite tail, right? But to implement it practically, you truncate it at some point, it's almost zero, right? So then you have a sequence of maybe, maybe 10 long, 5 long, or whatever, that you're going to implement as an A causal filter looking five time steps into the future, which you can do if you know R of K well in advance. So that's one application where you do actually want to take an inversion the other way. Okay? Any questions?
All right. But most of the time in this class, we're going to assume causal sequences and causal inversion. OK, so let's talk about partial fraction expansion. Um, the idea here is you have a number of, yep? When you implement a filter as, a, as an a-causal as an a-causal filter, um, do you, is it, is it implemented as a difference equation, or is it just? Yeah, it's implemented as a difference equation. So the output here, so let's say I, I made it a-causal by five time steps. That means this signal will depend on the input signal five time se steps in advance. So u of k will depend on r of k plus 5, which hopefully we know depending on the particular application. Okay? All right. Any other questions? All right. So partial fraction expansion. Um, the idea here is that you know, we can tabulate some basic uh, sequences, f of k, and compute the forward transform, which is easy to do, and tabulate them. Okay, so then you have a table of these z transforms of basic f of k's. Then when you're given a new f of z, you decompose that f of z by partial fraction expansion into the simple components, where each of those components you can find in your z transform table to back out what those component f of k's are, and you add them all together to form your overall f of k. All right? So, you know, the, the e of z we've been looking at. Right. That is found in your, you know, any z transform table. Right. So you can invert that. Right. It's r to the k, 1 of k. We're told it's a causal sequence. Some tables and some books will, will have two entries for this e of z, one as a causal sequence, one as an a-causal sequence. All right? Okay, so in general, um, you have some, you know, nth order f of z, some higher order f of z, and you want to compute the partial fraction expansion and invert. Okay, so here we have this general form of f of z that we're going to see very often or use very often throughout the term. Okay, um, so it's nth order because the denominator um, depends on, you know, n past time steps. Okay, and uh, we're going to consider if f of z is causal, m is going to be strict, or is going to be less than or equal to n. We're going to assume, let's assume initially, I guess it doesn't matter. So if m is less than or equal to n, that's a causal system. If it's strictly causal, m will be strictly less than n. Okay? So we often like to write things in terms of positive powers of z. So if we multiply by z to the n over z to the n, Right, then we'll have b naught c to the n plus b1 c to the n minus 1 all the way down to b sub m c to the n minus m over c to the n plus a1 c to the n minus 1 plus a2 c to the n minus 2, etc., all the way down to plus a sub n. Okay, we can factor out in the numerator z to the n minus m, which is going to be, um, you know, either a constant or a positive power of z as long as m is right, less than or equal to n. So we can factor that out and write it in this form. Okay, and this is what we're going to call general b of z over a of z. Some polynomial um, in the denominator, which we're going to call a of z, and a numerator polynomial b of z. Okay, um, so the other thing we will see is if m is strictly less than n, we see that there will be zeros at the origin, right? All right, now, so when we do a partial fraction expansion, we're going to think of a of z in terms of its factors. And we're going to write that as z minus p1, z minus p2, etc., z minus pn. They're going to be n poles. Okay, and the numerator we'll still leave as b of z. Okay? All right. So let's consider the case where we have all distinct poles, 
and let's initially assume that we have strictly proper or strictly causal system, so M is strictly less than N, okay? So then we want to do a partial fraction expansion of F of Z, okay, into the form shown here, okay? So we're going to take this form here, okay, we want to break it down and write it as this form here, okay? So, I'll go ahead and write this, so it's equal to B of Z over Z minus P1, Z minus P2, all the way to Z minus Pn. Okay, we're assuming that all the poles are distinct, so none of the P sub I's are the same. Okay, now, if we can put it in this form, okay, each of these, we know what each of these inverts to. So what does this first term invert to? What is the time domain sequence that corresponds with this first term? It looks very similar to that E of Z, right? So in fact, if it was just Z over Z minus P1, right, it would just be P1, the pole location, to the K, 1 of K, right? That was our E of Z we were looking. So then it's scaled by this coefficient C sub 1. Okay, and similarly for all the other terms, right? So now how do we find um, C sub 1? Okay, well, if we take our F of Z, right, and let's, so we have the left-hand side here. Um, okay, so we have this left-hand side and this right-hand side, right, both are F of Z. So if we take F of Z and we multiply it by Z minus P1 and divide it by Z, okay, then what we get, in particular if we focus on, on this left-hand side that I circled in red, then we get just C1 as the first term because we multiply by Z minus P1, divide by Z, right, so they cancel out. So then the second term will be C2, multiply by z minus p1, divide by z, that'll cancel out that z in the numerator, and then we have z minus p2, etc., all the way down to plus c sub n, z minus p1 over z minus pn. And so now if we take this left-hand side, evaluate it at z is equal to p1, and evaluate the right-hand side at z is equal to p1, Right? The right-hand side, every single term, except for the first one, has a z minus p1 in it. So when you evaluate it at z is equal to p1, they're all going to go to zero, except that term that doesn't have a z minus p1. So what we get is c1 is equal to this uh, expression on the left. Okay? And in general, so I've written it out here, c sub i is just z minus pi times f of z over z, that entire expression evaluated at z is equal to pi, okay? Now, what if m is equal to n? Then what would change here? All right, so if m is equal to n, right, the numerator polynomial here is of the same order as the denominator polynomial. So what would change is that you would end up with an extra term. So you would actually insert an extra term plus C0, some, some constant term, right? And how would you compute C sub 0? Final value theorem. What? Final value theorem. You could use the final value theorem. Z equals to 0. Z is equal to 0. Right, that's another. So, so if you evaluate, so if you look at everything else on this left-hand side, right, if you, they, there's a z in the numerator of every single one. So if you evaluate f of z at z is equal to zero, right, what you get, you know, so all the contribution from all these terms are all going to go to zero. What's going to be left is, is c sub zero. So c sub zero is equal to f of z evaluated at z is equal to zero. 
All right. Um, and in fact, right, so if you come back here, so when you evaluate at z is equal to zero, okay, let's look at um, let's look at this form. Right, so n, we're looking at m is equal to n here, right? So when z is equal to zero, what do you get? You get you're going to get b sub n over a sub n, right? Because m is equal to n, right? So c sub zero in that case, right, it's b sub n over a sub n, right? Right, and that's, of course, only going to be non-zero if b sub n is non-zero, i.e. m is equal to n. You have a high enough order in the numerator. Okay. All right, so that's the case when you have distinct poles, all right, and when you have repeated poles, things change a little bit. So suppose P1 is repeated three times. Right then, F of Z is going to have you know, something that looks as follows. So P1 is repeated three times, so you have Z minus P1 cubed, and let's assume all the other poles are distinct. Okay? Well, now what you want to do is just all the other poles are distinct, all the other poles are going to have similar form, you know, when you do the partial fraction expansion, similar form to what we talked about just now. But the P1, which is repeated three times here, will have three terms corresponding to it. Okay? And so how do we solve for the coefficients that correspond to the, to the P1, C1, C2, and C3? It will involve derivatives. Okay, so C3 is going to end up being computed in a way similar to what we just talked about. Right? So if you take F of Z and you multiply by z minus p1 cubed, and you divide by z. Right On the right-hand side, you're going to have c1, z minus p1 squared, right, and the rest cancels out, the plus c2, z minus p1, the rest cancels out, plus c3, plus c4, z minus p1 cubed over z minus p4, etc. Okay? So now if you evaluate both sides at z is equal to p1, on the right-hand side, all the terms will go to 0 except for c3. Right? So c3 then is given by this expression. Right? Now to figure out C2, as Pushback said, we want to take a derivative. So if we took the derivative of the left-hand side, you know, so before evaluating at Z is equal to P1, if we took the derivative of this with respect to Z, D over DZ of F of Z, Z minus P1 cubed over Z, so we take the derivative of all of that, Okay, so the right-hand side is going to be 2C1Z minus P1 plus C2 plus derivative of C3 with respect to Z is going to be 0 plus, then you're going to have C4, it's going to be a complicated expression, but there will be Z minus P1 squared in there, okay, times something else, okay, etc. So all the other terms remaining will have a z minus p1 squared factor in it. Okay, so now if we take and evaluate both sides at z is equal to p1, on the right-hand side, everything's going to evaluate out to 0 except for c2. Right, so c2 is equal to this expression on the left. And then we can do the same idea, take the derivative again with respect to z. So on the left-hand side, we'll have the second derivative of z, with respect to z, of f of z, z minus p1 quantity cubed over z. On the right-hand side, if we take with respect, take the derivative with respect to um, z, we'll get 2c1 plus 0 plus 0 plus c4. Now there's going to be a factor of z minus p1 in all the 
remaining terms. So now, when we evaluate at z is equal to p1, we're going to get 2c1 is equal to that second derivative with respect to z of this expression evaluated at z is equal to p1. Okay, so in general, oh, so I've written it out here, good. All right, so for when you have distinct poles, the c sub i's, the coefficients are computed as we described earlier. When you have repeated poles, so p1 is repeated three times, c3, as we discussed, is computed by that formula. C2, you take that first derivative of this expression and then evaluate it z is equal to p1. C1, you take the second derivative of the, this expression, evaluate it at z is equal to p1, and then divide by 2 because there was 2c1, right? And if you have, in general, a pole p of multiplicity l, then there are going to be l terms corresponding to that, right? So you're going to have um, a term, you know, c sub l z over z minus p to the l, um, et cetera, right? So you're going to have l coefficients that you need to solve for, just extrapolating from the pattern of what we saw. Um, this is the formula for that, okay? All right. Any questions? Okay, so um, the, that general handout that I've posted on partial fraction expansion when you have complex conjugate roots talks about you know, different ways of computing uh, the partial fraction expansion, in particular when you have complex conjugate roots. So here what we've talked about is you'll keep your poles separate. So you'll have these are all um, single poles. So if you have complex conjugate pairs, you'll have, you know, a P, I don't know, 4 and a P4 star, a complex conjugate of it. Okay, so then you'll have complex coefficients that would correspond to that. Okay, and so in that um, general information handout on partial fraction expansions, when you have complex conjugate poles, it talks about keeping those complex conjugate poles together so that you deal with all real coefficients. Okay, so that's another way to handle that. Okay, any questions? All right, so you can also compute the inverse Z transform using the inverse Z transform integral. So closed complex integral tends to be really uh, complicated to do, and hence, as engineers, we never actually compute this. We always use partial fraction expansion. So this is a contour integral where the contour, so if you in general have a region of convergence, that's an annulus, right? So here, the the inverse z transform interval, so you're given your f of z, you're trying to figure out what f of k is, and you can do this contour integral where the contour is any closed contour inside the region of convergence. Okay, so, um, yeah, I'm not going to talk further in this. So, it's, these tend to be um, more complex to do, and so we typically will do use the partial fraction expansion. Okay, all right, and so next one, all right, so we've mostly talked about, when we talked about Z-transforms, we were talking about sequences, the Z-transforms of sequences, the inverse Z-transforms of sequences. Now let's talk more about systems, we'll talk about transfer functions and state-space representations in particular. Okay. All right. So the Z-transform has the same role for discrete time systems as the Laplace transform does in the analysis of continuous time systems. So... Um, okay, so suppose you have, use the same notation as the book does here, so suppose you have an H of Z, okay, and its output is U of K, and input is E of K, okay, then U of K and E of K are fundamentally related by a difference equation, okay? The transfer function is defined as the ratio of 
the transform of u of k, z transform of u of k, to the z transform of e of k. Right, so h of z is the dynamic ratio of u of z to e of z. Okay, in general, it's going to be rational. What we're going to talk about, you know, assuming linear time invariant systems, is going to be a rational transfer function. There will be a numerator polynomial and a denominator polynomial. We'll call the numerator polynomial A of Z and the denominator polynomial. The numerator polynomial B of Z and the denominator polynomial A of Z. Okay? And, you know, through all the properties of Z transforms, right, so we know, so if the inverse of H of Z is, say, H of K, right, in the time domain, U of K is H of K convolved with E of K, right, in the frequency domain, the convolution property of Z transforms, U of Z is just H of Z times E of Z. Okay? All right. So in general, um, if you have an nth order difference equation where U of K, the output, right, if U of K depends on up to um, N times in the past, N time samples in the past outputs, and depends on the input E up to M sample, time samples in the past. Okay, so we have this nth order um, difference equation. Okay, and suppose I tell you what the input sequence is, E of K. Right? In general, it's very hard to solve this nth order difference equation. Right? What we've talked about before is we want to take the Z transform of this entire difference equation, okay, and solve for U of Z in terms of E of Z, okay? So we can take the Z transform of this difference equation, making use of the time shift property and assuming zero initial conditions, right? So if U of K has as its Z transform U of Z, right, then U of K minus one has as its Z transform Z inverse, right, unit delay times U of Z, and minus a2, z to the minus 2, u of z, all the way down to minus a sub n, z to the minus n, u of z, and plus b naught, e of z, plus b1, z inverse, e of z, plus all the way to plus b sub m, z to the minus m e of z. Okay, and we can factor out, collect all the terms that have u of z in them, so we're going to move all these u of z's to the left-hand side, and we can factor out u of z, and what we have left is 1 plus a1 z inverse plus a2 z to the minus 2, all the way, plus a sub n z to the minus n, so that whole thing, times u of z, is going to be equal to B naught plus B one Z inverse all the way to plus B sub M Z to the minus M. All of that oops, times E of Z. I can't fit it in. Okay, so that's E of Z. Okay. Okay, so I'm just gonna write E of Z is in here, okay? And so H of Z being the dynamic ratio of output to input, so that's U of Z over E of Z, right, is equal to then, so U of Z over E of Z, so that's a, is equal to B naught plus B1 is just in fact this, right? So it's this, which is that polynomial in Z inverse divided by this polynomial in Z inverse, okay? So this, again, we can multiply by Z to the N over Z to the N, right? Assuming a causal system, M will be strictly, M will be less than or equal to N, okay? And so call the numerator polynomial B of Z and the denominator polynomial A of Z, right? Which is covered by that. Okay, so rewriting this, so this is the same thing as at the bottom of the previous slide. So h of z here is a rational function of a complex variable, 
we've already referred to this, but formally, right, the zeros or the roots of B of Z are the zeros of the transfer function, and the roots of A of Z are the poles of the transfer function, okay? So very common H of Z we're going to see over and over again is just the unit delay. So H of Z is equal to Z inverse, okay? That's the dynamic ratio of U of Z to E of Z, right, which means that right, E of K is our input that goes through Z inverse, our output is UK, right? And so if we look at where we started from in this difference equation, right? So if H of Z is Z inverse, looking, uh, looking here, right? We see that B1 is equal to one, everything else is equal to zero, right? So if B1 is equal to one, everything else is equal to zero, we see that UK is equal to EK minus one, right? So that is a delay. So UK is equal to the input one time step ago, right? So it's, this is a unit delay. Um, and so this is something we'll, we'll see Z inverse blocks very often. So that's just a unit delay. Any questions? Okay, so that's kind of a, a review of transfer functions or a quick overview of transfer functions. Now let's talk about state space representations. So you should know from continuous time classical control um, and uh, other systems theory classes that um, you should know how to convert an nth order ordinary differential equation to a set of n first order ordinary differential equations. Okay. Similarly, an nth order difference equation, okay, such as such as this difference equation. Right, it's an nth order difference equation. You know the lapsed maximum elapsed time that you see in this difference equation is you know is a time difference of n time steps. And so it's an nth order difference equation. And you can convert that nth order difference equation into a set of n first order difference equations, okay? And this is often done because uh, numerically it's much easier to solve a set of first order difference equations than to solve n, and then to solve one nth order difference equation. So in fact, in MATLAB, when you give a transfer function representation, so you give an nth order transfer function and tell it to simulate that system underlying in MATLAB, it converts it to a state space representation and actually that's the simulation, because numerically that's much more efficient. Okay, so let's, um, in, t in order to talk about state space representations in more detail, let's take a third order example. So we'll just take our um, third order version of what we've seen earlier. So we have H of Z, that's a dynamic ratio of our output U of Z to our input E of Z, and so third order, we're going to have B naught Z cubed plus B1 Z squared plus B2 Z plus B3 over Z cubed plus A1 Z squared plus A2 Z plus A3. So the numerator polynomial we'll call B of Z, and the denominator polynomial we call A of Z. Okay, so in all of this, We've always assumed, you know, that this highest, the coefficient of the highest power in the denominator is one. Okay, that's without loss of generality. If it wasn't one, we just kind of absorb them into the b's. Okay. All right. So for a particular transfer function, this third order transfer function, there are many state space representations. Um, but we're going to talk about one particular one, um, which we'll see again later on in the semester when we talk about state space design of digital compensators and that's the control canonical form. <clears throat> okay, so we're gonna, gonna derive the control canonical form here. So U of Z in general is equal to H of Z times E of Z. Right? H of Z is equal to B of Z over A of Z. Okay, so then we can write that U of Z is equal to B of Z over A of Z times E of Z. So what we're gonna do is actually group 
this part together. So we're going to call e of z over a of z c of z. Okay? And so u of z then is equal to b of z times c of z. Right? And from here we can write um, a of z times c of z is equal to e of z. And so we have these two equations representing our system. Okay, we have some intermediate variable, which we're calling c of z. All right, so let's take both of these. Okay, let's write it out and take the inverse z transform. So u of z is equal to b of z, c of z. And we're going to take our third order. All right, so we're going to take this b of z. So this is equal to b naught z cubed plus b1 z squared plus b2 z plus b3, that's our b of z, times c of z, right? And then this other equation, I'm going to write out as a of z, c of z, and a of z is this third order polynomial. So we have z cubed plus a1 z squared plus a2 z plus a3, that times c of z is equal to e of z. Okay, so that comes from the second equation. All right, so now we're going to invert. And so let's invert, because it doesn't matter. So if we invert this one, u of z inverts to u of k. And then if we take term by term, b naught z cubed c of z is going to be b naught c of k plus 3, 3 times in advance, right? Then we have plus b1 c of k plus 2, that's the next term, plus b2 c of k plus 1 plus b3 c of k, right? And that is actually this bottom equation on the page. All right. Now, this other one, okay, so now if we invert this one, right, we have c of k plus 3 plus a1 c of k plus 2 plus a2 c of k plus 1 plus a3 c of K, right, so that's just taking the inverse C transform, assuming zero initial conditions, and making use of that time shift property we proved last time. So then E of Z inverts to E of K. So rearranging gives us this first equation. So if we write C of K plus 3 and move everything to the other side, C of K plus 3 is equal to E of K minus A1, C of K plus 2, minus A2, C of K plus 1, minus A3, C of K. Okay, so we have these two difference equations. These are both third-order difference equations in that we see a time lapse of three time steps okay, in each of, the, each of the equations. All right? So what we want to do is write down a state space equation. So we want to convert the overall third-order transfer function um, which really represents a third-order difference equation. We want to convert that into a set of three first-order difference equations. Okay, now it turns out that state-space representations have a one-to-one -one relationship with block diagrams that only include simple unit delays, um, gains, and summers. So what we're going to do is take those two equations at the bottom and draw a block diagram that only contains simple unit delays, gains, and summing junctions. And then from that, we're going to write out um, the state space representation. Okay, so I think it's probably easiest if I do this on the board so we can see the equation at the same time. Um, all right, so, so how many unit delays do you think we need? Three. All right, this is it. These are third order difference equations. Okay, so, all right. And 
we think of E as our input, so somewhere coming in from the left, okay, is our input signal, E of K, I give myself plenty of room, and somewhere on the right, our output of H of Z is U of K, all right? And we're going to have three unit delays, Z inverse, Z inverse and Z inverse. Okay, so, and um, let's call them C of K, right? So if, if the output of this is C of K, the input is what? C of K plus 1. And so then the input of this block is C of K plus 2. And this is going to be C of K plus 3. All right, so let's look at this first equation first. So C of K plus 3, that's this signal, is equal to E of K plus a bunch of other things. So we have a summing junction. Okay, so C of K plus 3 is equal to E of K minus A1 C of K plus 2. So I'm going to take this signal, multiply it by A sub 2, and we're going to subtract it from in this summing junction, and then minus, oh, thank you. Duh. Okay, A sub 1 minus a sub 2, times c of k plus 1, and minus a sub 3, c of k, okay? So that so this part of the block diagram now has sort of represented this first difference equation. Okay, now the second difference equation will produce U of K, or output of the overall system. So U of K is equal to B naught times C of K plus 3. So we take this signal, multiply by B naught, To come into a summing junction yes. here. Okay, plus B1 C of K plus 2 plus B2 C of K plus 1. plus B3, C of K. All right, so now that gives us our overall diagram. Our input is E of K. Our output is U of K. Okay, and this overall block diagram represents our third order system. Okay? All right. Now, we happen to have now a block diagram that only includes simple delay blocks, gains, and summers. So we can actually, from there, write down what the state space representation is. So when we um, write down state space representations, when we have a block diagram that only consists of unit delays, gains, and summing junctions, typically we assign as the state um, the outputs of the delay blocks. So making sure, keep with the so this is x1 of k, x2 of k, and x3 of k. Those are our three states of the system. Okay, so x3 of k plus 1, right, is equal to x2 of k. And x2 of k plus 1 
is equal to x1 of k. <coughs> All right, and this is x1 of k plus 1. All right, so then we can write down state equations, right? So x2 of k plus 1 is just x1 of k, x3 of k plus 1 is just x2 of k, and x1 of k plus 1 here is equal to e of k minus a1 x1 of k minus a2 x2 of k and minus a3 x3 of k. All right. So now we have a set of three first order difference equations, right? The time lapse in each of these equations is only one time step, right? Okay, and these are much easier to solve even if we have a set of them. Okay, so in general, what we want to do, do here is that we want to write the overall state equation in terms of you know, this x of k plus 1 is equal to, use the same notation, look, a x of k plus b, the input is e of k, and the output here is u of k is equal to c x of k plus d e of k. Okay, where x of k is our state vector, okay, so x of k in general for an nth order system is going to be n by 1, okay, so in this particular case it's going to be 3 by 1, so x of k in this particular case is just equal to x1 of k, x2 of k, and x3 of k. Right. Okay, so if x of k is n by 1, x of k plus 1 is n by 1, a is going to be n by n, it's a square matrix. Right. And e is scalar, so in this class we're just going to assume single input, single output systems, so e, the input, is scalar, 1 by 1. The output, u, is also scalar, 1, one by 1. So this is the input. This is the state, and this is the output. Okay, so x is still the state, it's n by 1, so that means that c must be 1 by n, a row vector. d is scalar in order for the equation to work out, right, dimensionally. Okay, so a is an n by n matrix. Let's write down a, b, c, d for this third order system. Okay, so here, line here, right, so x of k plus 1 is just a vector consisting of x1 of k plus 1, x2 of k plus 1, x, x1 of k plus 1, x2 of k plus 1, x3 of k plus 1, right, so that's going to be equal to, I'll just write it as this, a 3 by 3 A matrix times x of k, Actually, it would probably be easier if I go ahead and write it out. So x1 of k plus 1, x2 of k plus 1, x3 of k plus 1 is equal to our A matrix, which is 3 by 3, times x of k, which is x1 of k, x2 of k, x3 of k, plus B, which is a 3 by 1, times e of k, which is a scalar, right? So just reading off, you know, filling in the matrices from these three equations at the bottom of the page, right? So x1 of k plus 1 is equal to minus a1 x1 of k minus a2 x2 of k minus a3 x3 of k plus e of k, right? So that's the first uh, row, the entries of the first row. So x2 of k plus 1 is equal to x1 of k, so we just have 1 there and zeros everywhere else, right? And then x3 of k plus 1 is equal to x2 of k, so we have a 1 there and zeros everywhere else, okay? Now u of k, the output, all right, is, so let's finish this and then we'll and there, so u of k, let's write down what u of k is. So u of k is equal to 
um, okay, let's go this way, is equal to b3 times x3 of k plus b2 times x2 of k plus b1 times x1 of k plus b0 times x1 of k plus 1. But what we want is we want u of k in terms of x of k and e of k, right? Where x of k is x1 of, consists of x1 of k, x2 of k, x3 of k, right? So we have this x1 of k plus 1 that we need to replace, right? So we need to then trace back further. So x1 of k plus 1 is equal to e of k minus a1x1 of k minus a2x2 of k minus a3x3 of k. If we substitute that in for x1 of k plus 1, then we're good. Because then everything is in terms of x1 of k, x2 of k, x3 of k, right, and e of k. All right, so grouping things together, we have, this doesn't work well, this one. All right, so that's equal to, so take all the x1s. So we have b1, we're going to factor out x1 of k, plus b0 times minus a1. So we'll write it as minus a1 b0, all of that times x1 of k. And then collect up all the x2 of k's. So we have b2 plus b0 times minus a2. So we're going to have minus a2 b0. All of that times x2 of k. And then similarly, plus b3. And then have another term, which is going to have a coefficient b0 times minus a3. Or minus a3 b0 all of that times x3 of k. And finally, we have plus b naught e of k. All right? So then we can put that into our form here, okay, into this form, where we can write u of k is equal to the 1 by 3 rho vector times x1 of k, x2 of k, x3 of k, right, our state vector, plus d, which is a scalar, and so this overall is c, that's d, times e of k. And so just reading off there, we have, since I can't quite see it, it's b1 minus a1 b0, Right, is the first entry, and then it's b2 minus a2 b0, and b3 minus a3 b0, and d is equal to b0, right? So that's, for this third order example, the A state space representation, which happens to be in control canonical form. Are there any questions on that? Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about, a little bit more about control canonical form next time and we'll um, actually talk about the generalization to nth order systems, okay? All right, if there are no final questions, we'll go ahead and end there. So homework one is due next week, Tuesday, by 5 p.m., and I do have office hours now if anybody has questions, All right? Great. Say that again. Oh, yeah, so I also have office hours on uh, on Friday, if you can come then. Oh, okay. So then just, uh, you can make an appointment. I'm actually, there's only two left this week. Um, let me, okay.
So let me just end this lecture, otherwise it's going to still record us, and everybody will listen to your question, which you, you might not want. So.